Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think the notice sheet has read it out by mail is complete. Um, if you needed one more warning, your phones are all going to go bleep at three o'clock. <laughs> um, but apparently, only 4G and 5G, so if you're on good old 3G, you might not do it. Uh, so don't run around headless, it's only a test. Um, but they do seem to want us to tech like I, I mean, seems like a good idea if we're going to have an earthquake or something, then perhaps we should know in advance. <laughs> right, um, so we welcome Sharon to the lectern this morning and we look forward to your message. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, I think it's been four or five months, I think, since the last time I've been here. So um, I always find this place to be a nice place to come into. It's nice and cozy, and it's a really nice fellowship here at this church. Now, I am going to be a little off from what the lectionary is, because I've decided to change up the message a little bit to something that has been in my brain kind of seeping away for a little while. And it just came again to the forefront this week when I was having a conversation with someone else. So we're going to start the service off with our first hymn, it's number 690, The Church is One Foundation. Please stand if you're able. this week 
of how glorious your creation is. The days that have just gone have shown how the world is slowly waking up after a cold and damp winter. With the early flowers, the daffodils, the tulips, the primroses, and a few more than I just don't know the names of, have provided a splash of color just when we really need it. To the sights of new growth from the trees and the shrubs, the days trying to be a little bit warmer than the one before. Lord, we can only marvel at all the world offers. We just take the time to look for it. And Heavenly Father, even when we do take the time to enjoy the world around us, a question we can ask of ourselves, do we take the same time with each other? We thank you for the sacrifice your son, of your Son, for what it has given each of us that call the church home. But we are taking what has been taught outside these four walls of the building and into the community that surrounds us. And that is the question we have to ask. So in a moment of quiet, let's just reflect on that question. Lord, we ask that where we have failed in bringing you to life in our communities, for your forgiveness. Lord, we are blessed beyond all measure in being able to appreciate the created world around us, to be able to come together in worship and fellowship, to being a part of the greatest family on earth, be able to call ourselves your children. All this comes from being able to hear and take into our hearts your words. The words Jesus used to teach us not only today, but tomorrow, and to all the days to come. And Lord, we come together to say in unison the words taught by your Son, the disciples, in the prayer of our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Thy is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So I said, I'm not quite using the lectionary fully today. So part of the things that I'm going to have you think about before we get to it. How many of you went away for school? Whether it was university, a trade school, or whatever. Oh, like university. <laughs> I kind of went away, but not the same way. Um, when you moved away from the area that you've grown up in, how did it feel? It was a bit strange, <laughs> a bit unique, a bit, oh gosh, what am I doing on my own? <laughs> Mom and Dad are not there to pick up everything after us anymore. <laughs> Hopefully you were taught a little bit before that. But also think about when you came back home. How did it feel? Was it different or the same? And that's what I want you to contemplate a little bit. I'll bring it back up a little bit later in the message. Unfortunately for you two guys, it's going to be what you're going to be experiencing later. <laughs> 
take notes. <laughs> so we're going to stand and sing our next hymn, number 594. Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us. Now we are going to skip verse 2 because we don't do communion. Not allowed. So stand and sing the <laughs> Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. 
and you will tell me who here in your hometown is the first you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only many from the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, the town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching, because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit, who cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. And the second reading is from Acts, which you can find on page 1033 of the Church Bibles. And it's Acts chapter 2, reading verses 36 to 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Thanks be to God for his word. <clears throat> now they are a bit different. They come from one side of Jesus' ministry at the very beginning. And we have what I would say to be in the ministry of Peter and the apostles. With Jesus down in the middle. <laughs> unfortunately. But I'm going to link them together for you, though, in case you haven't kind of figured it out yourselves. But well, before that happens, as we think about those words, let us stand and sing on 443. Come, let us sing a wonderful love. Stand <laughs> Thank you. 
instead of this child that screamed, yelled, and caused the church to quit in a soundproof roof in the basement. <laughs> in Sunday school in the basement, the church upstairs, three of those four of us. And Dad told me all about it because he was the one who was the treasurer at the time, so I knew all about it. I pulled up a little bit at home for it as well. But think about that time when Jesus went back home, back to the place where he grew up. Now, what was a little bit different for Jesus is he was not a married man. He went back probably, you know, you figure between 28 and 30 to his hometown. And 28 and 30 is a bit old to be still single in his time. There was arranged marriages all over the place. That's how they kept the community together as well. But the parents usually took care of these things. And for some reason, they didn't do it for Jesus. He was different in that respect. And the thing is, though, it goes back into the hometown where he grew up, where people knew him at the age of five and at the age of ten, and could see him running around with friends, having to look after his brothers and sisters as he was the oldest. And being there with mom. And eventually taking time and started going to dad, Joseph. Going out to his work. Because that's what happened. They would go to the synagogues, they would go to the teachers, the priests, and everything else for the first three early years, is what I would say. And they would learn the language, they would learn how to write, how to read. And it was all done through the Torah. They would always pull out the scripture, and that's how they got taught. Fantastic memories. They could read off the songs like you would believe. I can't even read one of them. But you know, it was just that's how they were taught. But by a certain age, it was expected you start going with dad or with mom in learning a trade. With mom, it was learning how to take care of the household, all the kids, everything else. With that, it would be whatever he was in. So Jesus would have to go with Joseph, go off and learn the trade of being a builder. Now we have translated as a carpenter, but we respect it's a builder um, in general terms. And here he was having to learn this. Now Joseph, you know, you can only do so much around the town, you eventually have to take jobs elsewhere. And Romans were great at giving jobs elsewhere. And he probably was on some of those roads doing some of the brickwork and that stuff for them. He might have been out working for other people. And here's Jesus bagging along behind him to learn the trade. And that's what he was supposed to do. But yet, we have Jesus in a much more different way. Now, when this time in the Gospels was written about Jesus, you have to think about what happened prior to that. He went to see his second cousin, John. Now, where Nazareth is, if you ever get to look at that, <coughs> is in the hills. They're not the hills, not by our sake. They're in hills. And it's the town built downhill. And where John was, was down in the desert park, down by the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, near the Dead Sea. And that's where he was hanging out. And Joseph went, and Jesus went down to see him. And that's where he got baptized. And that's what we had as a prelim before he came back up. And he met, obviously, a couple of his disciples down there. They went and followed him back up, and they came up towards the Burnham, which is at the very top of the Dead Sea, at the top of the Sea of Galilee, which is And that's where he, they were. And as fishermen, they would come through, go down the sea, come them back up to the town with their fish for the day. So he learned all about fishermen by talking to these guys. It wasn't his trade. And then, in that time, he met a few more guys, they ended up following him around, and they thought, this is the teacher. This is the one that we're waiting for. 
But then Jesus makes his way back home. And to be honest, from Capernaum to Nazareth is probably half a day's walk. So the group of them walked home to Jesus' home. And you can imagine mom, when you kind of get to this, and unfortunately maybe some of your moms may have had to do this as well, when you brought some of your mates home from school, <laughs> all of a sudden there's a lot more cows to feed. Two other things had to get stretched at the way of your supper and everything else. But the hospitality was always there. It was expected. It was part of their culture to be in this state where if you had a stranger come, you offered them the hospitality, a roof, a meal, a place that they could feel safe. That was what it was designed for. We can you imagine Jesus coming home with a group of dogs? You know, four, five, six of them, trotting them online. And they're not small men, because these guys have been fishermen. They've been out there, they've been working and everything else. So it's not as if it was when he was 10 years old and a group of little guys coming across and you know, he'd still make buddies. No, these were grown men. But the family took them in, no problem, and they stayed with them. And then that fateful day of going to the synagogue happens. Now, in the synagogue, we have the teachers. We have the priests. We're lucky we got one of the priests from the temple that's come by and has a bit of a chat with you. But normally, the priests would go to the temple and they come back. So we have those teachers there. We have the people that have seen Jesus probably all of his junior life when he was growing up there. And a few other new students probably there with them. Because the people that were really, really smart, yeah, they were called in to become priests. That was what they were going to be doing. Because they had the grasp of learning. And they understood the philosophy. And had the mental capacity to get all this in their head. To be able to say it quite well. It was a really, really interesting time for this. For everyone. So, we have the synagogue. Now, if you've ever been in a synagogue in the ancient times, and luckily enough, was in Israel and was able to visit them. You go in, and you have up on two sides, possibly three, if depending on the width of the building, where it's like a step in case, and that's where the men sit, sat. Ladies, not welcome, unfortunately. At the very front, as soon as you walk in, the first thing you see is what is the altar, what we would call the altar. And in there, off to the side, you have the bookcase with all the different scrolls in it, the copies of the Torah that were for that synagogue. And everyone sat down, and the teachers, the priests at the front, they would pull out the scroll, stand there in the middle, unroll it, speak from it, roll it back up, and teach from it. So they had the center of attention, and they stayed in the middle of the place and had everyone's attention. Here we get Jesus doing something that's radically different. He was given the scroll, he read from it, handed it back, and then went and sat down. Not something that was ever done. If you're the teacher, you stand like I am right here. No, he went back and sat down. And I can almost imagine a bit of a hush coming over the crowd of men that were there. And going, what are we doing? And that's where he started to teach them. He got down to the people's level to teach them. He spoke to them eye to eye. He talked to them about things that they could understand. And that was the radical difference in his message. He got down to the person's love. And you can imagine the two guys at the front going, what is he doing? Why is he doing it this time? Are you trying to show us up a bit? And they kind of all sit there going through their heads, figuring away, 
don't like what's happening here. Because not only was Jesus teaching in a way that people understood, and with a tone of voice that didn't have anybody questioning anything that he was saying, but he was telling them probably a different message than the priests were doing. <coughs> and they didn't like that a little bit. But that was the difference with Jesus. He had left that little town as a teenager, and they didn't see him as a man until probably that day, when they saw him in this different light. But yet, still, for a fact, not everyone accepted him. But we are grateful that there was people that did, and that went along with him. There was people there that did not see him other than Joseph's son, Mary's child. But there was people there that saw him as a teacher, a leader, and even a Messiah. And that whole part of him being questioned wherever he went stayed with him throughout his ministry. A lot of people did recognize him as the Messiah, as a chosen one. They just were too scared to say it out loud. But they knew it. They felt it inside. They saw his change in him and saw something even better. Now we know from history, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Romans, they didn't like this at all. And through that, we just now celebrated Easter and the empty tomb that came with it. And we are very grateful for that. But then you look at what then Peter starts writing about in Acts. We fast forward this whole time, but we don't really know how long it was between the crucifixion and when this part of Acts was written. We know that it's 40 days for the ascension. But after the ascension, how many, how much time lapsed between people converting? You can guess, but there's not actually any sort of positive one way or the other how long it took. But then we did get this message of more acceptance at that point in time. Because the disciples could say, I've seen the prison war. They had the grateful part of being in that room when he rose, and were assembled, and he came in and showed us him. And that's what they testified to. That's along with the messages and everything they had learned over those three, three and a half years they were following Jesus. And all of those messages of grace, forgiveness, love, acceptance of everybody, teaching people at their level, talking to them about things they understood, that's what they got out of all of this. And they continued that message, which thankfully allows us to be here today. But think about where, what it was. That radical forgiveness of sins, that baptism that we were given, that Peter says to them, to be baptized and have your sins forgiven. Only the priest, the high priest, actually, could be the one forgiving sins, because he was the direct conduit from God, as they saw it. So to have someone else say that to them is a radical message of the day. And it is a message that actually, thankfully, 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating that forgiveness of sins. But what I'd like for you to hear, again, is that little part of the passage in Acts. The words of warning. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And that corrupt generation at the time was in the temple, was in the leadership within the temple, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And we see that throughout all of Jesus' ministry whenever he went into Jerusalem. 
to the Romans themselves and the ways that have been accepted by the people just to get along. Working alongside them instead of saying, hold on a second, you're our captors and we're your slaves. They worked alongside them because they wanted to keep peace. And you have to think about the multiple gods that the Romans came with into their society, and especially Caesar as their god. But we also have the concept of widows and orphans, the ones that were left behind, the ones that were the outcasts of society. People didn't really look at them anymore. But Jesus brought them to the forefront once more. Because the widows and the orphans goes back to the Old Testament and where it was told that the people were supposed to take care of them, look after them, make sure they were okay. And that was their correct generation. What's ours today? Do we look at money and the prestige that it gives us as being part of our corrupt generation? As the value of the almighty town gains so much more in people's hearts than the love for one another? Fame. Well, we have that saying, you get 15 minutes of your fame when people are on TV. But we have all these reality shows. For what reason? For us, entertainment. For them, it's money. And 15 minutes of fame. With a lot of technology nowadays, which has expanded dramatically over the last 20 years, is that instant gratification, the instant finding out of what's happening, not only in your local community, but around the world. And a lot of that is for the good. But there's people out there that use it for bad, that target people of all generations. And we have an anxious society. It's kind of what I call the buzzword of the day. People are anxious. They don't have the real knowledge of what has caused the anxiety in people. There are various things, and there's so many factors that can go into it. But there are also people out there that are using that word to get out of doing something they don't want to do. Because they just don't want to do what you've been asking them to do. And I feel for the people that really do have an anxiety within them, because they are the ones that are now, we're looking at more skeptical, because of people abusing that book. So I'm going to ask you one more thing. What do you think we need to do to bring a revival back to our faith? Look around the demographics of the church today. And what do you have? There's not very many young people here, is there? And that's across all churches. I'm not going to say it's just one church. It's across the spectrum that we have an issue. Technology and other things happening outside, being with your friends and everything else, is taking priority over learning about church and learning what it is to be a Christian. It's not like the days where I was a child and it went to be what church was so there's no lots about it. We've given them choice, and I'm grateful that choice has been given. Don't get me wrong. People you need to make the choice to become a Christian. But what are we doing to help them make that choice? <coughs> How long has it been going on that the demographics, the age of the church has risen up? It's been going on for a while. And I remember my mother talking about Billy Graham in Scotland coming over. And it would be a stadium of 70,000 to 
<laughs> We've had nothing like that since. So what does the church need to do today to give faith a bit of a revival? Technology may have been against us at one time, but through the pandemic, we're going to embrace some of that technology to allow people still to gather and have fellowship together. And I think it's that embracing of technology, allowing people to have fellowship even when there's not the building to be in. Look at what's on YouTube and how many outrageous videos are out there. Yet the churches are also now going into them. They're embracing that part of technology to bring church to the person at their time when they can sit down, relax, and embrace the message. Will the revival of the church happen through technology? Yeah, probably. Some of it will. But then, what is our responsibility to also revive our faith? Because the Catholic Church is not a denomination. The Catholic Church is all churches, all Christians. And it's something that happens outside the walls of the building. Jesus Christ gave his life to allow us to be changed and how we are looked at in the world today. Do we embrace that change? Or do we shy away from it? One of my other messages I deal with faith. So I just want to give you that definition. Faith is a strong, unshakable belief that is not something that's in your head, but it's there within you, within your inner self, telling you what is the right thing to do. That, I think, is where our faith is today, more than anything else. It's something that's unshakable. It's within the core of our being. And we just have to let it shine. We have to let it shine in whatever way possible to allow people to see what it means to be a Christian. Faith, hope, and belief. These are what make up our personal relationship with God. This makes up your personal calling in front of Him. Our question today how do we answer that call? How do we revive our faith? And let it shine so others may believe as well. I'm going to bring you to our prayers of intercession. Right, so uh, in the light of what we've just heard, I think we should spend quite a lot of time praying for the church, praying for us as individuals, as part of the Methodist church, and as part of the wider church, that uh, we can um, grow both spiritually and in numbers. So, uh, I'll uh, open it up to all of you to uh, pray. So those 23 last week, uh, I heard about uh, C.
similar sorts of things, but the Methodist Church is losing numbers, and there's been for ever since anyone who would like and remember. And that uh, what what is the solution? And it was suggested that two things were vital. One was prayer, and the other was a new uh, inflowing of your Holy Spirit. Yeah. So we might catch that best in <coughs> fire. But uh, so for those reasons, some people uh, I pray that we will have more prayer, deeper prayer, and that we will catch your spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into this church to be inspired by our compassion. We thank you for our time today. It's not just a message. We just, we just need you to be able to hear their consciences because that is how we know the spirit is working in us. Let them actually act on it. Pray that uh, we will uh, break down some of the barriers which stop people coming to church. But uh, it's so we don't see it as a club to join or place to go, but as a community of your love. Amen. Father, we bring to you our prayers, especially those who are praying. Help them, Lord. Help them realize what they need and what they need. What they need. Father, we pray for our uh, junior church. They don't meet on a Sunday any longer, but or at least not here. And uh, but we pray for them. We pray for Anne, who leads them, and we pray that they will know you more that they will see something of your love and your fellowship. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have also prayed for our world. There's conflict, 
and more in uh, Sudan and uh, Ukraine and various low-level conflicts in other places. But we pray that uh, your peace and justice will uh, come into those situations. But we pray for uh, the local elections coming up that so we will have, uh, uh, we will be able to vote for candidates who have got some Christian faith, or at least uh, embody Christian values. Amen. And Father, we bless, we hope that you will bless all of us here and those we know. So let us just take a minute or two in silence to remember those who are parts of our congregation, families and friends who are in need of prayer. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. And let us just have a small prayer as well. Lord, we let us for your blessings not only on this church, but on all that has been given, to the gifts of the many people that attend, to the gifts of those that are at home that have contributed over the years. And Lord, bless the monies that have been given to be used in this church, to be used outside of your community, to be used to bring your name. And if you'll stand and sing our final hymn of the day. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. I missed one, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to sing two in a row. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> we're going to sing two in a row at the end. We'll have one here. It's number 156 from the Breaking of the Dawn. And then after that, we'll remain standing. And saying the classic blessed assurance Jesus is mine. So please stand here.
a mind that forgets the battle, and a soul that never loses faith in God. Amen. Amen.